for, for over half a decade now, AI Omaha has been fortunate enough to provide its membership with presentations by the AI Firm of the Year. And in 2013, we are pleased to continue that tradition. Tonight, we have the privilege of uh, seeing a presentation by Todd Williams, one of the founding members of Todd Williams, uh, Billy Thiessen Architecture. Did I say that right, Todd? Yep, okay, great. Um, Todd has asked me to sort of wing this, uh, this bio of his, and I have to tell you, it was, it was quite lengthy because he, he and Billy have quite a few accomplishments, accomplishments in their uh, career. And um, rightfully so, uh, the most notable this year would be the, the firm of the year. Um, a little bit about Todd and Billy. Uh, Todd is a Michigan native, and he received his undergraduate degree uh, and Master's of Fine Arts uh, from the, uh, or excuse me, Arts and Architecture from Princeton University. Billy was born in Ithaca, New York, and received her undergraduate degree in Fine Arts from Yale and Master of Architecture from UCLA. They began working together in 1977, and in 86, they established their partnership in a studio down in Central Park South, where they still work today. Um, the 28-person firm has primarily focused on institutions, and if any of you have viewed their website or seen any of their accomplishments, you'll know that they, uh, they're kind of the go-to for that sort of, sort of thing. Um, as, a, as a team, the firm designs buildings that are exquisitely made and useful in which uh, ways that speak to both efficiency and to the spirit. Together, they have built compelling work, uh, which includes the Feinberg Residence Hall at Princeton, uh, the Hereford College at the University of Virginia, the Neurosciences Institute at La Jolla, California, the Cranbrook Natatorium in Michigan, the American Folk Art Museum in New York, and the recently completed Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. Uh, their current recognitions include the AI Firm of the Year, and they've also garnered uh, national and international acclaim. Williams and Thiessen um, are recipients of the American Academy of Arts and Letters Bruner Award, the New York City AIA Medal of Honor, as well as the Thomas Jefferson Medal in Architecture and the Chrysler Award for uh, Design Innovation. In 99, Todd was inducted into the Fellows, and in 2007, both were elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science. They are both educators and practitioners, and they're committed to making the world a better place through architecture. And one thing that I found that was interesting in Todd's bio was that um, they practice what they preach in that architecture um, is an act of profound optimism. And I think in this presentation, you'll see that he has not lost his, his spirit and will continue to fight the fight for, for all of us uh, in, in many years to come. So um, I give to you Todd Williams of Todd Williams, Billy Thiessen Architecture. Yeah, thank you. This is a pretty, it feels like a pretty good turnout, so thank you so much. It's a, a great pleasure to be here, and, and uh, I'm only, I only regret that I don't have more time. It's interesting to fly in and be sort of stunned by the landscape of not only the, the, the land, but actually the way the buildings sit on the land, and it seems um, exciting and powerful, and it's also fun to be down here in this Bema Center and uh, the area down here where it feels so vibrant as an arts district, so that's great. Um, the hands here with the, uh, with the soil are really saying that uh, I do believe that architecture is, is a, we are working, uh, we are serving others and we are, have to get our hands dirty in many ways that requires us to uh, to be modest enough to accept the, that all of us working, building things um, are serving one another. And, uh, and then and the next image, this is the image of the studio last fall. So that's the total studio. You can see Billy and me there. We work in the same space. Uh, my desk is right in the middle as Billy's is in the middle and everyone is able to see whatever I've done on my desk and, and I'm able to look at what they do on theirs and I think this issue of kind of sense of a studio with um, 
there's no question we're the leaders of the studio and the oldest, but, um, but we want people to understand our successes and our failures. And there are no locks in the studio. Actually, the, working for the OBO, we, we have two locks. Yeah, that's Eddie mentions that. But uh, toilets do have locks on them. That's correct. <laughs> Um, and uh, we're now required to lock up our documents due to a recent project we've got. Um, but it is really a sense of the quality of the people who are in the studio, and I know that that's true, and, and I can feel that in the spirit of the room here. I'm going to show seven projects and go quickly through it. Some of you know the work, but I'm going to guess most don't. So we're going to start 20 years ago with a project in La Jolla, California. And this project was near the sock, but not at all where the sock is. The sock, as you know by, by Louis Kahn, looks over the Pacific Ocean as its own institute, but this, this project was part of Scripps, uh, and Scripps owns the building and had the buildings made. The Scripps campus are the white buildings we see there, and they began to build a kind of research campus on the other side of the, the street, and they said, you know, that they, they for this neurosciences, and that's the, that's, that's an image, rather attractive image of a, of a skull in the cortex, but the, the issue was that this was a, for study of the brain and they were going to get a site on the other side and it would be one of these very regular sites. Uh, we uh, immediately, we never worked out, out west uh, and uh, we never had such an assignment and it was a, a wonderful thing that Gerald Edelman and Nobel laureate had moved from Rockefeller out there to run this institute. Um, and he was doing both science that in laboratories and also basically uh, intellectual science, science that didn't require labs at all, but rather strictly theoretical. Uh, in the center of our plan is a scientific auditorium. He wanted that and thought that would be important for people to come together. He thought not so much for uh, science, science meetings, although certainly they do use it for that, but for uh, to listen to music. And so we see the program divided into three elements. And in this very early sketch, and I would say it wasn't built like this at all, we were cutting the building into the land, uh, allowing North Torrey Pines to, uh, give, allowing a glimpse of it from North Torrey Pines. Ultimately, we even eliminated that, that glimpse. That's the cars up between the two trees. And on the other side of North Torrey Pines, it slopes off, and that is, in fact, where the main campus is and, and where uh, the sock is. But it was still a beautiful site, and this is the building a number of years later, we, it was the first time we'd really dug a building into the land. Uh, about 50% of the laboratories are thoroughly and completely under those trees back there. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's really a kind of a, a monastery for the study of the mind. And uh, you can see the, the roofs are all uh, either usable or they're uh, finished from above. But it's really the space in between that counts, the space for scientists to gather as they're moving from one building to another. Here in this image, we're looking at the uh, theoretical center, which is a three-story building. We used long incline walks to help to allow people and, and with short passages to walk through the land and to enjoy the beautiful landscape. Uh, on the left, the sloped glass uh, is for the laboratories, which extend deep in the ground. This is the lowest level of the three-story building. In all of our work, we're trying to encourage people not to use elevators. There is, in fact, one elevator here on this campus, but, but to use the stairs and use your senses to move from one place to another. Uh, in this case, we also, Billy, this is actually Billy's work. It's a tapestry in the dining hall, and, and I was, uh, occasionally we break our work apart. And Billy did this tapestry, and I did the, designed the chairs. Uh, I think the chairs are less sturdy than the tapestry. Um, but. Uh, and here we were looking to the distant, e to the east, to the distant view. We actually used to put the mechanical systems under that mound and uh, made sure that we had a, a, even though there wasn't any spectacular Pacific view in this area, we had a view that there was kind of sense of interiority and a view of the distance. It was made of poured in place concrete um, and, and then using also Texas fossil stone. Actually, interestingly, when Louis Kahn, after Louis Kahn had done the the sock and he did it of, uh, of travertine. Later he, uh, the buildings he were, was going to make later, he was going to do them of, of Texas fossil stone. He didn't know about that at the time. And there's a fabulous stone just outside of Austin called Texas fossil stone. Beautiful stone, relatively inexperienced. This was just after it opened 
and we have walked underneath North Torrey Pines in the Pines in a tunnel, and we're basically standing on top of the laboratories, looking down into the space and the auditorium in the distance. Uh, using wood, which is we've done for years, to balance the warm and the cold. Uh, the wood is generally in shadow here, um, and it allows a kind of softness, as well as the, the Texas fossil stone adds a kind of warmth uh, that contrasts with the coldness of the concrete. Here we are in a passageway between the the uh, theoretical uh, spaces and the, and the laboratories and see a wash of, of light coming down. In fact, we're out of doors under cover because it does occasionally rain there. Um, and here we're looking at the, the slice between the labs and how the labs are really buried under at least the darker part of the labs, really the, the area where one has uh, clean, clean rooms and so on is really buried under the soil. I should, these are ancient computers from 1992, um, antiques. Um, sorry, I haven't updated the photographs here. And then looking toward the scientific auditorium, which is concrete on the outside and has a, a covered vestibule and then very large doors that allow you to enter into the auditorium. Jerry Edelman, who's a concert level violinist, wanted me, sure would be wonderful for the acoustics of music. So that was a, a great treasure. The next, the next project is one in, in Cranbrook, it, uh, is in, in Michigan. This is actually where I grew up and actually the school, I, I was privileged to go to this school and uh, they had, it was a boys and girls school designed basically uh, by Aliel Saarinen and then later by Aero Saarinen. And the, the building we're looking at is down there in red. Um, and their need at that time was to have an indoor swimming pool because the boys and the girls no longer were on separate campuses, they were together, and the athletic portion of the campus would be on the boys' campus, which is near where the, the red building is. Um, I should say that there was a kind of renaissance at Cranbrook, and there still is, where after Saarinen and, and uh, the Saarinens had done their work, there was a fallow period, and uh, subsequent to that in the late 90s, Stephen Hole, Rafael Maneo, um, and uh, uh, Johanny Palisma and some other wonderful architects were adding elements to the campus and we were lucky to, to add this one. So this was actually our master plan for the, uh, for the athletic portion of the campus. The, uh, other than the pool, the, they've done other things but they haven't made the rest of our master plan. But we were trying to thread together the idea of the intellectual, bringing the athletics as close as possible to the, uh, the intellectual portion of the campus. Uh, to try to make a building that was recessive. We can see here in the image the very earliest buildings of Aliel Saarinen back in the early 20s when he's really thinking of Finnish nationalism and then later on the, on the uh, right of your screen uh, when he's more influenced by a kind of prairie style American architecture uh, 20 years later. But this campus has always had a, a strong connection between the intellectual and, and the physical um, and, and uh, landscape and, and art. Our plan, we decided we would not, uh, at the Neurosciences Institute we'd made really great savings in terms of energy by burying the buildings, keeping them separate. In this case we decided instead of air conditioning a pool to dehumidify it, we would actually allow it to be naturally ventilated. And now it's been in operation for 12 years. The school never had, uh, they went to other other schools to, uh, to train and they never had much of a swimming team. Today, in the last couple of years, the, the women and the, the men have both won state championships. So it's really changed the program around. Uh, a pool is actually a fairly dumb structure. It needs good depth and it needs um, good volume um, to be a fast pool. If anyone's ever designed one, one needs to be able to dissipate the waves. One needs to be able to breathe fresh air. and. Uh, and so this building is, has, you can see, is deep and it's actually sunken into the landscape, uh, attempting to make sure that the, the building is less important than the landscape. And in this uh, not very good model, it's showing an idea which was that the span of the structure, you can see some I-beams there, is actually made of steel. The building that supports that steel is concrete. It's infilled with block and brick, but we have a very deep section and that oculus is the way by which the building, one of the ways by which the building breathes. So going to, we went to Hibbing, Minnesota and looked at uh, the way that they 
open mines and closed mines and we had them design build these hatches that would open the roofs and the walls at the right time so that the breezes would pass through and, and actually exit through the top. And I will say it's worked very, very well. The, the old Sarandon buildings had not been accessible. There are no women's facilities. The bridge bridges to the Aliel Sarandon buildings of the late 20s, actually 1929, when he stopped working on that portion of the campus. And uh, here, just after it was completed, we decided that the building should be uh, just a wall in the landscape. And uh, at the end of this very long axis that had been originally thought of by Saarinen, uh, we made a crease in the landscape and made a blue brick wall. Actually, this brick actually comes from the Midwest here. Um, these panels are, are large panels that hydraulically operate uh, by the control uh, of the manager of the pool. They can be closed, and if the pool is closed, you have fans to ventilate the building, but if they open, then they naturally ventilate. And uh, so they are hydraulically operated. And some of these are only 15 feet tall. The others on the other side are 25 feet tall. But it's a kind of magical place because it's both a highly competitive space, but it's also a beautiful and sensual space. And that's one of the problems to me when you're swimming uh, in, in, indoors. It's that they're always noisy, smelly, um, you know, nasty spaces, uh, the only pleasure of which is working like hell in the water. Um, but here, here uh, the, it's a both sensual and, and active um, uh, competition. I'll, I will put one footnote, which was my mistake. I believed that, that they would love to competitively swim with the roof hatch open, and they don't. In fact, they don't even practice anymore with the roof hatch open because the swimmers track each other by camera underwater and they want to be able to see perfectly and evenly, which is disappointing to me, but they still love the, the building and they, they use it in recreational periods and open it up, but they don't use it competitively, much to my chagrin, so I learned something there. I wouldn't change anything, but I might just change my expectations. Um, <laughs> images of the pool. And that what's fantastic today is that the, still it's a powerful experience inside, but the building has virtually disappeared. These, this is now four years uh, old, and so those pine trees have completely engulfed the building, which is kind of makes it more amazing when you go in. And I believe, and Billy and I both believe, that um, it's really what is inside that's more important than what's outside. It's, it's what you, that buildings are always should be designed from the inside out, um, and that we as human beings are basically built from the inside out. And it is the inside, our insides that is much more important than our outsides. And I particularly say that as I'm getting older. Um, but um, it is actually the truth. I think that we are emotional and um, our, our emotional state is much more important than our physical state. This project is at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, the red indicates our building that will be there and the, the square indicates the engineering campus at, at the University of Pennsylvania. Lou Kahn did a wonderful building here and Sarandon actually did a very interesting door very close by, you know, Richard's Medical Center. It's actually way off in the corner. For those who can see my finger, this is, this is Richard's here. But the engineering port, that's the medical portion of the campus. This is engineering at University of Pennsylvania. And we're uh, really on a site that has been there for uh, over 100 years. Our building is to add on to the engineering campus, and it's a bioengineering building that connects to two buildings on either side. They're both nationally listed buildings. Uh, one on the left, the bigger one is by Copen Stewartson, and the one on the right is by, by Paul Cray, who you may or may not know was Lou Kahn's master at the University of Pennsylvania, a fine architect, and this is not his best building. Um, but it's an important building, and our building both connects to the two of them and acts as a new gateway into the engineering campus. And so the yellow arrow shows that foot traffic moves through this uh, along the yellow line. The blue line indicates that one moves between the buildings around the quadrangle uh, horizontally, um, energizing the whole quadrangle as engineering. And bioengineering is a combined engineering that connects, uh, instead of just being a single tower of, let's say, electrical engineering, is beginning to combine other things and is a wonderful major today. Uh, the building has wet labs in it as well as dry labs. 
and so the ventilation and the shafts are terribly important. You can see that it's divided and you can see those big X's are in fact the shafts that feed the building and then distribute the air on either side to the laboratories. And then the section is very, very complex because town, which is the Paul Cray building and, uh, and uh, no, uh, and Moore, which is the Paul Cray building on the right, and town, which is on the left, didn't share the same level. And so our building becomes a bridge between them. It becomes, allows them to connect to one another they never had before. So it's also connecting different levels. The building is cantilevered off a center core and uh, you can see the section where it's really trying to hide the mechanical systems. And uh, it's a very, very, uh, I think quite a surprising structural uh, feat that we're cantilevering the building on either side and creating this really large entrance now, which actually looks more aggressive in this picture than, than maybe it is. But it's saying that we're honoring the two buildings on either side by being different and being a tower or an entry element. In this case, we used a hand glazed brick, a green brick, which was quite different from the red brick on either side and said, well, it relates, and I do believe in relationships, but I don't believe in mimicry. So it's more important for me to, to relate to someone than it is to follow them directly. And, uh, and in this case, that's our, at least our, our belief that this, this relationship is critical. We, we at first thought it should be blue brick, and actually that would have been pretty, but ultimately the uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, we were able to sell them on the idea of green brick being an Ivy League campus. So um, it's, a, it's a combination of a, of a machine and a hand glazed brick. Uh, and inside we, we using, you know, if you look at the work, you'll see that there's an influence from Alto somewhere there. I've been always an admirer, not only of the Saarinen stuff, but of Alto. And Alto frequently used tile on the inside of his buildings, both to give light and to give durability to it and to give a sense of the hand. And we've done that here uh, in a different way using this tile, which comes from Sausalito, Heath tile, and with a kind of thumbprint on it that Billy likens it to the gink color of the ginkgo trees, which are outside uh, in the fall. The laboratories are, well, this is a teaching laboratory. The, the, the scientists' laboratories are just totally chocked with equipment today. And in this case, we began to, to have another idea. We've, I've always believed that elevators are necessary things and, and not, and that stairs should be the way by which you move from floor to floor and that there's nothing more wasteful than to take a fire stair and not use it and then not to make it a beautiful place. So in this case we took the fire stair and made it a poured in place concrete and made it a kind of Escher experience um, so that you don't double back on yourself and we did this as an 85 foot tall building and then you'll see the next time around we've done this once again it may be my last. My swan song I've done it to a 150 foot tall building. But we brought, it's poured in place concrete and it's beautifully made and it's an interesting space to be in because it's not as if you're in a tunnel, you're actually in a volume and you can stop and have a conversation there and that stair opens to the outside, we see it here. We, uh, we, we designed the, the back two courtyards and instead of making, this was a service alley for the site before and we made it into two small courtyards, a kind of contemplative courtyard here uh, with a little fountain and then a slightly more active courtyard on the other side. Um, I don't, this, this project is just finished actually a year ago, but it took 10 years to do. And um, I'm never a fan of, of competitions first, but we've won a couple. And uh, the problem with winning a competition is that everyone thinks, okay, you won the competition, here's the design, build it. And that doesn't work very well. I think that for me, at any rate, I believe that the sort of working with a client, not sort of absolutely working with a client, is more important because I think I'm only about half, really, any of us is only about half as creative as the client who can really uh, spurn us on to sort of new heights. And we did win this. Um, that red dot shows more or less where it is in Hong Kong, a tiny site, kind of hidden site. Asia Society existed on 69th Street and Park Avenue in New York, and they started by the Rockefeller family to have an understanding of Asia. And uh, this is 
the Asia Society taking its rightful home in Hong Kong where it actually can communicate Asian values and be a kind of center for uh, both cultural and intellectual and business interests in, in Hong Kong. They were given an incredibly weird site, um, which was a f former a barracks, a marine, a, a, a British a military barracks, uh, actually a munitions place where they made munitions in the 1850s, and which was in British hands until it was turned over in 1996, but actually fell in, into disrepair much before that. And here's the site when we first visited it, the buildings when we visited them. In Hong Kong, largely, these buildings are torn down. And in this case, they were saved. They were overlooked in a way. And our assignment was to renovate or restore these buildings and then to add a new energy to them. Um, the site was very, very, this is the, both you're both seeing our final project there, which is, um, a, we call it a kind of horizontal garden, horizontal building in a vertical city. And that plane here that I'm going to put my hand on is the roof plane of the building we made. And that goes continuously through the site. And that is a co-planer, the same plane as the rest of the site, which was cut in in the 1850s. And the British cut this into the mountainside and then created these two large berms. And the berms, which are in this image here, are to stop these buildings from exploding up and, and destroying one another. So um, basically, we tried to renovate those buildings and a fourth one down here on the lower part of the site. So cars drive in, drop you off, and then you ascend a set of stairs and or walk under a bridge or over a bridge through the jungle to the upper site. In Hong Kong, it's, it's very, very hot and humid. They have different kinds of rains, red, white, and black rain. And black rain means you basically can't be outside. You can't breathe in that rain. It's so heavy. But these are the, these are the, this is the program. Here we have an auditorium that we made. The berm here, the former, these are both munitions storage spaces. This we've turned into an art gallery. This is where they made the munitions, the, the chemists for the munitions, and that's turned into offices. Then another set of offices down here. Our building has just brought this back to life. Um, you can see the steep site. We can see the GG is a building from the 1930s. Our building is behind it. Cars don't go into the site. They drop you off under cover here. You walk in and then descend and see the bridges that you either walk under cover on the lower bridge, sloping at 1 in 20, or the upper bridge, which is a dead level. And look back to our, our, our building where we have a large meeting space and a cafe. Uh, and then you see the city of Hong Kong behind it. There's a nullah or water that runs right through the site and then we've also amplified this by a fountain that spills water from the top down through the site. So the moment you enter, you sense the sounds of birds in the, in the water. Here we are on the top of the roof and you can see that we're really surrounded by towers. Ours is anything but a tower. Looking back toward the mountains on the top of the roof which is used for events, sculpture, on the lower incline walk. We use the walkways to convey services from the upper site to the lower site there. And, and you can see in that sketch, my sketch on the right, you can see the people standing on top of pipes, which you then can access. And that allows us to connect the sites to one another, but also to shelter the movement between one and another. And that continues into where you get to the historic buildings on the upper site. This is where the, the old lab one, which has been restored becomes offices, walking undercover to the museum, which is here, eight foot thick walls, granite walls that actually are thermally excellent. And then we cut through a berm to go to the second laboratory, which is turned into, this is a lighting corridor actually used for actors to move back and forth for performances. Was that, that piece on the right is from the, really from the uh, late 1900s. Uh, they didn't want to bring candles into where the powder was because it could be explosive. It would be explosive. Uh, section through the building and uh, the building in use today. And now the, the, the next project, which maybe everybody knows, is the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. This is a really long story. Um, that project took 10 years. This one only took six years. Um, 
Maybe everyone knows the story of Dr. Albert Barnes, and we shouldn't go through it, but he had this estate in Marion, Pennsylvania, and which is a, obviously, a, in this case, a, a beautiful suburb, a building that was designed by Paul Craver, his art collection. His wife was interested in the Arboretum. This was an Arboretum, and they, during Albert Barnes' life, people would come to visit his collection at his home. But after his death in 1951, the visits became ever less frequent and the foundation eventually got itself into terrible financial situation. And, and I should say, before we got this project, there were, and even during it, there was many, many acrimonious sort of accusations. Was someone trying to steal Dr. Barnes' collection and so on and so forth? Were they going to break his will? Dr. Barnes had said, the paintings should never leave the walls of this place after my death. Even though he changed them every single day, he never, and was going to change them the day he was killed instantaneously by a car, a car accident. His, his will said that they must remain as it was and you could never move them or, or uh, sell them. And, and so they were losing about $500,000 a year in the late 1990s. And uh, you can see that in, in these images, this is uh, La Dance by Matisse. This is 1922, his, Matisse's first large mural, installed mural. Here we have paintings by both Picasso and Matisse here. Uh, he has a collection of a thousand paintings that he amassed. Uh, and, the, and the site that we have moved that, that building to is on the parkway. This is a parkway. At the end of it is the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Great parkway design and close art style. The free library, maybe many know. Can't see it here, the Rodin Museum. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the great uh, Natural History Museum. At any rate, these buildings really adorned the parkway in Philadelphia. And, uh, and we've added our building to that. And in the place of our building, six years ago was a youth detention center. And it was a place where only the homeless were at that time. So the building has been, when, once the barns were given the site in downtown Philadelphia, the judge permitted them to move it there because it would save essentially the barns, and, and I think it has. Uh, we interviewed for this job, and actually this was the interview sketch, Billy sketch, our idea, that in Marion it was a gallery and a garden, and we wanted to make sure that there would be a gallery and a garden and a garden and a gallery, and that was the idea or the concept idea uh, that we presented. And we actually presented this model, it's actually an idea that the the wood part of the model is the collection as it existed in Marion, and we had, we thought we'd bring light and life into the sequence of a thousand paintings. Uh, number one, because there was the idea of the arboretum there, and we wanted the garden to be present. Number two, Dr. Barnes only saw it, it's actually not a museum, it's a foundation for study, so Dr. Barnes believed that this was about study, and so we wanted to infuse the building with two spaces. Um, while not breaking the sequence. Well, this didn't become the building by any means. This, soon after that, after we got the commission, we began to work on what was really the problem. And this is an early model. What we can see there is that this, for, this first part, the center part, which faces south as it did in Marion, is more or less intact with two holes in it, one of which is a garden, one of which is a kind of a place to study. Um, and then the rest of it is essentially support. And, uh, for the next year or so, we made a variety of different models, all of which had that same partie in different forms. Until we got to something like this, which is what was built today. Uh, these are the plans. We, our idea was that you would not drive a car right up to the museum and walk in. The cars would stay at the perimeter, and you'd walk through a garden to get to it. Uh, I should say the, the study collection. One, with, this is the, the pristine gallery, which is where his paintings are, and there's a study space, and there's another garden space in that. The rest of it really supports that. We have changing exhibits, a cafe, um, conservation offices, all of which didn't exist in, in any great way in the in the original building. And most importantly, when you left the galleries in. Marion, you were literally stepped outside and went to your car. So we made a great indoor light court here, which sits between these buildings. Clearly, this has been, you know, looking at this is 
looks at a lot of architecture, including, including uh, in, in, in an oblique way, the Kimball. Um, our work often has been influenced not only by, by Alto and Saarinen, but certainly by Kahn. Uh, these are the offices that then support that. We've made sure that the L-shaped building uh, is separate from the collections building. And the, the building, more dramatic than it actually is, this element in the center is the, is the light box, and the low, long building on the left is the, are the offices. We can look into the uh, conservation lab from here. The, uh, this is the first, I think, from ground up muse museum, and again, it's not a museum, but a foundation, but it's essentially a museum that is a lead platinum building. So a lot of work has been done and, and good money has been spent to make sure this is quite an efficient building. The entire top of that long box, for example, are PV panels. Uh, the lower block is, uh, is green and, and, uh, and reuse of water is critical in this part of Philadelphia. So here, this is a, par a, a long table of water that is part of the park that is the Civic Park, which is before the museum. Um, as you walk up and go into the building, you're walking once again at, along another side, uh, element of water. This is a very two or three inch deep body of water and you pass under the, uh, the red uh, maples and then go in a way across a bridge and enter the building. The building looks completely solid, as, but it isn't. It's really a series of panels in this case of what is Jerusalem limestone in small squares that are hung up in larger squares to create a kind of, we would call it a kind of tapestry of stone on the building, neither being symmetrical nor as, uh, truly asymmetrical, influenced by uh, African fabric. Uh, Dr. Barnes and actually we collect African fabrics and are interested in Kente cloth and Cuba cloth and so in a way Dr. Barnes collection was was he was one of the very first people to recognize that art, African art, was actually real art and not just uh, ethnographic material. So uh, we thought that it would be interesting to try to add that even as we were trying to be in some gesture neoclassical on the outside of the building. Here we are looking back to the, the free library. You can see our building feels very much like it belongs and yet it doesn't. Uh, it's not neoclassical but it's using the same coloration of stone uh, an Ellsworth Kelly sculpture at the end of the pool. And the, the light box allows that light always to come in in a d diffused way. Uh, the top is PVs, as I've said, but the exterior is just sheets of glass and then we're bouncing the light in and refracting it in so that it's always changing, the light changes in there, but it's, uh, it's always a soft light in the light court. And then we've cantilevered, this is actually out of doors under cover in a complete cantilevered space. So. Uh, in, in two places in the, in the ex gallery experience, you can step outside in protected areas and be undercover. Uh, windows are all made of, of wood. Um, well, not all made of wood. The, the top on the left are the offices up above there, borrowing light from the light court. And here we are in the light court where you wait before you either uh, go into the gallery's experience, Dr. Barnes' collection, or you go into changing exhibits or Maybe you've had an education class. Uh, we d tried to design the certain elements as, as Paul Cray had in working with, with Dr. Barnes to also include African motifs. So these are, as you can see, very tall doors made of bronze, very simple doors. They're actually a grid, essentially, that stops a person from going through the glass that is behind it, but it has kind of an abstract pattern. Uh, for the first time in these, since actually 1951, you can actually look out into the gardens using the, w the windows. So we're right in the middle of the city. This is a, uh, you know, a beautiful spring day where the foliage is out in the wintertime. You can actually see cars in the distance. But here we are having full glass into the galleries. And at the same time, the, the, the paintings are hung precisely they were when Dr. Barnes died in the same idiosyncratic way and a very, very personal experience. So it's a combination of something that's both traditional and, and, uh, and contemporary. In order to understand contemporary molding, uh, traditional moldings, we didn't know anything about it. We actually, we asked them if they would build a full-scale mock-up of the galleries and we replicated uh, the, the moldings because we felt the moldings would be critical to the relationship between molding and painting. And we knew not, we would either have to copy them or we could do 
something else. And eventually we began to understand how traditional moldings were made. And we, through a series of mock-ups, have contemporized, I suppose, that so that it, there's, it folds together um, with the rest of the detailing of the building. You can also see we're testing out different plasters, we're testing out different wall papers, or actually it's a hessian in the space, and here we're also testing out the idea of lighting in, by clear story the rooms, which we eventually did. This is the finished building, actually one of the a table we designed that sits between the gallery experience, the garden between the gallery experience, um, a level that is below grade with the, that garden drops actually down into the lowest level where you can read a book, get coffee, uh, take classes, uh, and, and shop, if you wish. You can see the building's made of poured in place concrete again, as basically all of the buildings, the library, the loading dock. We're down to a couple more. I'm sorry, I'm gonna move quickly. I'm moving too slowly. This is a project just finished last year, last spring, which is the University of Chicago. Again, a competition we won. Was, once again, with the frustration that um, they wanted us to build exactly what, what we had won, but it, it wasn't gonna be possible financially. At any rate, this is the University of Chicago north of the Plaisance. You can see the, the sort of darker area. That's the University of Chicago. The Plaisance was a landscape that was made by Olmsted and Vox. And then our building, which is the south side of the campus, and is important because um, University of Chicago needs to expand to the south. And the south side of this part of the campus is actually in terrible social condition and universities trying to begin to reach out to stimulate that part of the uh, of their their campus and reach out to the community so we we the the site had been a parking lot um, we won it with the idea of a tower of the arts billy and i for 35 years lived on the top floor of carnegie hall in a small studio and we loved the idea of being in a tower of the arts so we sold them that you know, Chicago is a series of towers. We'll do a tower of the arts, just like the way we lived for 35 years. And then we'll do an industrial base at the lower level. And they had the idea that they would mix the arts. And so in this diagram, we're showing that the different um, constituents that are art constituents are mixed together in the tower. And it's more or less what was built. I'd say, once again, models trying to understand how you could build a, a tower that was primarily solid but had windows in just the right locations because I'm not particularly interested in glass towers. And then the final model of the building as it, as it was built and now the building actually as it was built. So we have a tower, the Tower of the Arts here. It's 156 feet tall with the fire stairs being the primary means of going up and then sawtooth roofs over an industrial shed space where you have the changing the the arts galleries and you can see it is in fact a kind of talking trying to talk to the towers actually on the other side of the campus at the university so in this image you're looking back to the illuminated towers at the other side of the pleasance i'll go briefly through the building uh, there are th four different performance spaces in the building um, i won't go into them there's a there's an art gallery but there's also a place for making art in the building there are many music practice rooms um, there's film study on this level it's graduate and undergraduate and as we move up through the building uh, this is the final sort of disposition of the tower and the base so it goes one level into the ground and one level above for the base three levels using the ground plane the ground this is the campus plane Campus plane is the, like your street plane here is the most important plane you've got. Everything really happens there and so you should, you can easily walk up one level and down one level. So this is the finished building. Um, we made it of uh, bars of Missouri limestone. It actually is a wonderful stone, quite varied. Um, one of the small lobbies. Uh, again, encouraging people to walk up the stairs. Uh, this is the, the auditorium for 450 people. Uh, the, art, the shop under skylights. The back side of which is the north side is facing north. The back side is solar panels. 
this sort of a little space that the building forms with old buildings. We were really in the place of the older uh, buildings that were, had been previously used for, for making art at the campus. Now this is the writing center. So this is a performance space. We're looking down on roof terraces where we can get them and otherwise we plant the roofs. There's two streets that we say are streets that run through the building. These red streets run north, south, and then basically two streets that run vertically. And uh, those are always supposed to be animated by life. And once again, we use the idea of putting the tile in the fire stairs to make them bring them to life. So this is a fire stair. And now the students are beginning to install art in the stairway. Which is, this is a teacher's art. Uh, making installations in the in the port and place fire stairs. Another image of the fire stair. Had a balcony midway up. We wanted to make something special. This is a, a space that opens, that slides open and closed and can be a kind of seminar space looking back at the campus. And a dance space at the very top, a performance space, penthouse at the very top of the, of the building. Kind of grand space for performances so you can look back over the campus in Lake Michigan and a little outdoor terrace up there. And the final project that, that is now under construction is our two ice rinks in Brooklyn in Prospect Park. I'll briefly go through those. Um, this is a kind of cool project. This Prospect Park, Olmsted and Vox designed Central Park and the second park they designed was Prospect and Brooklyn's really a kind of great place to be today but it was a great place to be in the 1800s when they had done this and they we're very proud of this, although I don't really love this as much as Central Park. They were particularly proud that they had a bigger lake than they made it in Central Park. You can see it, it's an artificial lake. They have a mile long meadow. It goes from here to there, so it's continuous meadow, and they have a much greater forest, and they felt it was a better park. In the area where the yellow is, that was always a recreational area in the park for the poorer people of Brooklyn. And at that time, they had music performances, a carriage concourse, and a lake on which people skated. Uh, but by the, uh, and, and indeed, you can see them skating here in the late 1800s on the lake. But by the 1900s, they, the early 1900s, that had stopped. And they uh, made it in 1956, they destroyed Music Island and made a very crappy skating rink here. Never used during the summer, and they took the carriage concourse and parked 300 cars there. And our assignment was to see if we could restore, keep the ice skating, and at the same time get rid of the cars and restore the, the lake's edge. And so this was the image of the park uh, three years ago. And this is our project, which is to have an oval skating rink. You can see an oval skating rink and then an ice hockey rink there. This is a green roof that covers it, and our building is essentially buried by the landscape. You walk up gently over this and walk down that landscape, and the entire lake edge has been restored. So or that's what's happening now. You can see the amount of building that actually is required to support this one. Cafe and, and uh, classrooms and educational rooms to ice skating rentals and mechanical spaces, and all of that's underground. And, from time to time, and this is supposedly a big deal, we had this idea that you could connect the two rinks, and this, when it's connected, will be the largest single artificial ice in the U.S. Um, in the summertime, this will turn into water play, like kind of Millennium Park surface, and the other under por covered portion will be used for, uh, for rollerblading and so on, and, and events. Sketches of walking into the building were just used the same kind of stone that the park is made of so that, it, and here actually on the left is an early sketch of a mural by that Billy that will be made and, and I kind of created a calligraphy on this canopy of the roof. You can see that happening. Um, these are like the Cranbrook pool lights in a grid that will illuminate the ice skating but also kind of a, 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 just the central pleasure of a sense of skating uh, in that space. This is the mural of tile Billy is creating. The actual ceiling, reflected ceiling plan. And actually these are recent shots of the building which is coming along. A final project is really no project at all. It's a, 
something we did at the Venice Biennale. David, David Chipperfield invited us to participate in the Venice Biennale this, this last year. It's called Common Ground. We like the theme, believed in the theme, that we're all in a way more connected than we are separate. Uh, you know the Arsenale, maybe you know it in, in Venice. I've done this before and I've hated it. I'm not sure that I really loved it the second time around. Um, it seems like a kind of place by which you're competing for attention and uh, the, the world looks in on you and it's a... Uh, the, the great spaces, this is the Arsenale, it was made basically in 1300s, I think it was. Not at the far end is something called the Garden of the Virgins. Uh, we first thought about putting our project in the Arsenale. I'm sure no one's been to the Garden of the Virgins, unless you're a virgin. Um, and I'm not sure anyone had been there, but we decided we'd want to put our project as far away as possible. Um, and our project was to say that uh, we would, we loved Wunderkammer's, the idea, this is a Cornell box. We loved the idea of a cabinet of curiosities. And in our life, this is actually a picture of our home, uh, well, actually our home in Carnegie Hall, uh, but it's sort of similar today, where things are mixed together, just objects, drawers full of stuff. Um, we love objects, and uh, so we thought that uh, if we, we were given, that we said we'd like this place that nobody had been to before, no architects had used this space. It was called the Casa Scafali, or it means house of shelves in Italian, but it actually is, they stored seeds for the garden on these shelves. You can see the building looks like a bush. Um, but if you make it out there, it's kind of cool. And so what our idea was to have boxes made and send them to friends, have the friends fill them with whatever they want, have the friends then send them to Venice. We would open the boxes. We'd put the stuff on the shelves, curating it, organizing the stuff. We had no idea what we'd get. And uh, the, in a way, we would extend our idea of common ground to our friends. It would be a kind of a DNA of, of people that we cared about. And this is our cabinet maker, Stephen Eno, in his shop in, in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, we decided to invite Stephen, who works alone, to be a participant too. And uh, he, had, he, he totally panicked and spent, you know, two months worrying about his project, but built, built the boxes, all gray boxes, so they'd fit on the shelves. And you can see, we put people's names on the shelves and then we signed every box and then sent them to friends throughout the, uh, the world. And then we arrived, uh, that's Billy and Stephen and our son Kai in Venice five days before the Biennale opened and then opened the boxes and said, what have we got here? And of course we got much more than we ever bargained for. Um, and then had to deploy this stuff inside. And so this is the finished product. Um, I, not many people saw it, but whoever did actually got a kind of treasure. We said no one was allowed to put in architecture. It had to be anything but architecture. Um, but it had to be something that tell, told us about you. These are Mac and Merrill, Mac, Scoggin, Mer Mac's motorcycle pants from the late 60s, Merrill's cape. Uh, some people just threw things in the box. In this case, they sent the box over to Venice and the Venetian authorities said, what were these feathers? And Merrill said they were chicken feathers and the Venetians wouldn't allow them in. Um, so they came back to New York and then we put them in our suitcase and brought them over um, and hung them up. Um, but some of the participants, there were 34 and we're making a little book of it. We then sort of filled the shelves. This, uh, well, you, you know many of these people. This is Glenn Merkin and Wendy Lillian. This is Marwan al -Syed. This is our son and his partner. This is Johanny Polisma. Um, this is Marlon Black, oh, no, this is Marlon Blackwell, this is uh, 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 Brad Tofel, I'm sorry, Stephen Hole down on the bottom. So we'll look at a couple of the boxes. We asked Peter Zumthor, who, instead of filling his box, sent the box over empty and had his assistant install these exactly as he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but he at least participated and he was happy. Uh, that's uh, Johanny Palazma in, his, uh, in, his, in Finland organizing actually a husk of bread here, which is kind of fantastic. Johanny you know, is a writer and films from Tchaikovsky and his own passport. So he made it very, very personal, as, Pe as Peter did. Um, Rick Scafidio, Liz Diller, and Charles Renfro. You may know their work. And this is Stephen Hull, who did, of course, put his buildings in, but masked them. <laughs> uh, and then you can imagine. Um, 
And this is Toyo Ito, who took uh, rocks from the tsunami, which had been written on by people, and sent them in a box. Uh, our friend Claudia Jungster, we asked a few people who were not architects. Claudia is a, is a fabric artist from the Netherlands we love, and uh, this is the wool of her sheep, and the, the wool dyed by the, the, the plants that she grows. She called it uh, Adoring Rumpelstiltskin. This is Ursula von Reinigsvard, who's a sculptor in New York and we love, and she, she made these weird lumps and stopped, put them in the box precisely. Um, Marlon Blackwell, this Johnny Cash there giving you the finger. Um, Will Bruder, a friend. Uh, Richard Meyer, Richard, is, if you know him, has always done little collages. In this case, he cut up, or had somebody cut up the catalogs from his office and made a nice collage. Tom Main, of course, couldn't help being Tom Main. <laughs> made it, he called it a gold bullion. But it, it was spectacular because they all basically had a specific relationship to the box. Our son, ending with our son and his partner. And he's the only one that cut the goddamn box up into a tiny little box and made, took all the wood and saw how, how small he could make the box. Um, <laughs> so at any rate, we're, this is what a child should do to his parents. Um, <laughs> not a child, he's 28, so uh, still doing it to his parents. But anyway, we're happy to have him. And I want to end the, this back with the hands. The issue for us is always, um, is, is, it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration between Billy and me and every person in the studio and every piece of work that, work that we've got, every site, every person that's uh, building the work. We want to honor them. And uh, as we get older, it's what we not only build here on Earth, it's what we leave behind. That's really what counts. So thank you. I, I'm, you know, it was probably longer than anybody wanted, I'm sorry, but I'm also happy to take questions. I think Jay had said that. The journalist wants to know what you're doing. He wants you to name it. What do you call it? What we do? In what we... They want you to name it. Yeah. If yeah, what kind of work do we do? We're past, post, now, modernist. Yeah. yeah. What are we doing now? Yeah. Um, I'm serving. Okay. I'm serving. I, I, and I'm, I, I think I want to lose myself in every project and find myself in every project. Um, that's what I want to do and I want Billy to do the same and every person to do the same. And it is true that um, and the problem is you, as you get older you, uh, you think you're reinventing things but you're, many, many things we've done before you can see we continue to do the way we deal with space is pretty much the same. Um, I'd like to think also that we are always in relation to things. I don't want to be it. I don't want to be the thing. I want to be in relationship to something. So at the University of Chicago, that's a pretty big phallus, right? But I want to be in relationship to the University of Chicago more than that piece. They, and that's why I was a little pissed off. We knew that this would be kind of a concept that would be interesting in Chicago, a tower and a could be concept here. No, it wouldn't be a good concept here. I'm sorry, the towers don't belong in my opinion, but sorry, I apologize if they, and the Chicago really is a place of towers, and so we thought that was a compelling argument there, but in the end it was actually very, very difficult to do, and it sapped a huge amount of energy from the project, but it was a concept, and they believed in the concept, so I'd like to be in a relationship where the concept can be modified by the circumstances and modified and modified and modified. What it call, a call, I don't know. Yeah. The journalists would yeah. Yeah, the jur journalists would not dig it? No. No, no, they don't. I don't care. Doesn't matter. So, well, I'm only interested in the work. It's okay. And uh, it's, uh, someone can figure it out later. Um, I'm just lucky to have the work. Any other thoughts or questions or remarks? I'm Uh -huh. Well, I, I am adamant that the client is equal to the architect. And if they're not, we'll have a crappy building. And uh, they need to, someone there has to say, the buck stops here, because I'm saying the buck stops here. Billy says the buck stops here. I want there to be some resistance, some person saying, that's it. And, uh, 
But like any relationship, if you're making a relationship, you want it to be a good relationship. So I'm pretty cautious about getting into relationships with people, clients, because I'm going to give my all, and I want them to give their all. And if they're going to do a half-baked job, we shouldn't be doing it. Or if they're going to over-control me, we shouldn't do it. And I think that's an attitude we all should take, honestly. I believe it's the correct one in personal relationships and financial relationships and everything. So I, it's just, it's, it's critical that they are um, at risk as much as I am, or we are. And, uh, and, I, and I truly believe that our good work only comes from good clients. I, it's a crazy, we take the credit. Look, it also looks like it's my work. Right? It's not my work, Billy's my work. It's not our work, it's the studio's work. And it's honestly, it, it couldn't exist without the clients. I believe that super deeply. Yeah, I'm not a particularly creative person. I'm constantly working on that relationship I like to build and I like to work. Mm -hmm. Follow up on the previous question, we talked about collaboration with the client being important. Uh -huh. The very idea of the environment project is to put it all in controversy. How did the collaborative effort work there? Well, actually, it, it was interesting. Um, there were two clients in my, Dr. Barnes was somewhere back here. Well, being respectful of Dr. Barnes, the decision had been made, and I wanted us to do buildings that would, a, a space that would simplify and enhance his collection. I think the lighting is, no question, the lighting is better. It's safer now, so I think his, Dr. Barnes is the kind of guy that would never be happy anyway. So he's dead anyway from 1951. But, I feel that, you know, if it, he might have been okay with that. The other thing that he was really interested in was the people. And so bringing it to Philadelphia felt fine. Mean, within that, I wanted to be a citizen of the parkway. I wanted our building to feel like it belonged on the parkway. And some people would disagree and say, it doesn't. It's not being classical enough. It should. There's Inga Saffron from the Philadelphia Park said you should have made an actual entry from the parkway. I don't believe that. I, I made other mistakes, but that's not one in my opinion. Um, so we tried to be a collaborator with the Parkway and, and talk with the, the Fairmont Park Commission. There was an amazing woman who was the building, uh, who I dismissed early, but turned out to be an incredible force who was head of the building committee. And uh, she wanted to make sure, I mean, she just kept pushing us to make sure it worked. <laughs> this is a terrible thing to say, but it, that it wouldn't fail financially. She wanted that great space for her that was an event space. And it really works as an event space. It's a event space. There were a whole series of things that she was very, very strong about uh, that we listened to. And we're now doing their house. And it's interesting that to come from, you know, realize how important Aileen Roberts was on that. So a bunch of people were really important, as well as every single person who built it because it's built beautifully. I mean, yeah. I have been both in the original Barnes and in the new one. Um, and the experience of you with the art and the new building is infinitely better. Uh, mainly because of the light. Uh, with the other building that was there. Yeah. Um, and it, it almost appears that the paintings were clean. Yeah. And I understand it had not been. Nothing was clean. Uh, but they're beautifully displayed. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, how do you feel about the move? Does that piss you off? No. Okay. Good. The park is a wonderful place. Uh, yeah. There are few cities where there is this confluence yeah. of, of wonderful public buildings. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think that's a perfect place for it. Yeah. Thank you. I feel really good about that, and I do feel both those things are true, and I thank you. Anything else? Can, uh, can you talk a little bit about the interaction of the studio and specifically how you and Bill work together or don't work together? Or mm -hmm. Well, I'm first we always work on the same projects together except when I told you about the tapestry and the chairs. That was sort of separate. I kibitzed on the tapestry, she kibitzed on the chairs. But we say we, we're not dividing it. That's true and not true. The fact is Billy has, doesn't have the same interests that I do. She's visually two-dimensional person. And she's non-confrontational, but she's like the Chinese in being not confrontational. They get their way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
<laughs> so I just, you know, there's a lot of noise comes out of me. I'm the active one, I'm the three-dimensional one. Um, we take a project architect and that project architect has to stay from beginning to end unless something really terrible happens. We want ownership. And so if I have a thread or a shred of an idea, Billy has to believe in that idea or I have to modify my idea or her idea you know, or somebody else's idea until we have a thought that's cohesive and then we try to slowly keep working on that throughout. You, but the two of you collaborate pretty much the whole way with the, with the team that's working on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Billy, Billy's the kind of person who at 6 o'clock at night is sort of like, I'm out of here. She doesn't, she stays until 8 and I usually pay for it. Um, so she has a limited interest, but her interest is deep. I mean, really, and her effect is super deep if you know her. Um, it is. So I, you know, there are people who seem to work, put in the time, and there are the people who put in the time in a different way. I, I'm not interested in separating it. We, once we accept a partnership, it's a partnership through and through. Just a little bit about your materiality selection on each project. Now. Okay, that's interesting. I have a lot to say there. First, I believe that all projects that come out of the earth are made of concrete. So concrete's the base material that needs to find itself somewhere. It's not blue cons concrete, it's foundational concrete that comes in and gives a grittiness to the building. And against that grittiness is something that's refined. I always believe that. Something is cold, something has to be warm. I just believe that those things have to find their way. And so Wood inevitably is a warming material, but sometimes stone can be warm, and, and so on. So another thing that we try to do, if I possibly can, is to use work lo locally, but I'm no slave to local material. At, at the barns, we use this stone from Jerusalem. It was cheap, much cheaper than the local material. It turned out to be great. But I do, at least we do go to the place where the stone is quarried. We find out how it's, what the stone is and how it's quarried and how you get the best stone out of the land and so on and so forth and you begin to work with people who know that stuff. I don't dictate it should be this way or that way. I ask it to emerge in a discussion. So a facade usually comes relatively late um, in terms of, because I'm less in, interested in image. It usually comes from inside slowly out. Um, I think every single surface counts. Every space is equal to every other space. If we believe in our bodies, every, everything is equal. Um, I'm, I'm miserable if we can't do it that way. I just hate myself and hate everything. I mean, I don't know. That's about it. Nothing more than that. I, I you know, I, I'm canny. I will say I'm kind of a, a shit relative to stuff. We get things built well. I, I will love two stones until the final one comes in at the right price. Maybe I'll love three. You know, maybe I'll love two different kinds of wood. Maybe I'll love two different cabinet makers. But I still, when I choose one, I want them to do their best. So, I, I mean, stuff comes in on budget. I try to take everybody's money. You know, normal stuff. No, I want to. I want to give back more than we than we gave, and, and generally, that people feel that because we work like hell, and it's a good thing. And that's. I should also say, you know, you may know that I do really no commercial work, and I apologize. I know many of you do. I did a lot of commercial work when I was young. I'm a little ashamed of that, but it's also been a decision because I could make very good money on commercial work, but it pained me so much when people didn't take care of it the way I wanted them to. Once we started doing institutional work, I found it more to my satisfaction. And now I'm feeling a little bad because I ended you know, close to the end of my career. I'm not about to make a goddamn commercial kitchen. I can't do it. Um, I would like to do low cost housing. I'd like to start doing stuff that's less expensive if possible. I'm terrified of it. Yeah, at, at some point, you sort of become so you can't get out of it. Okay.